By the 1950s, Walt Disney had established his studio as the leader in family entertainment, a reputation that grew by leaps and bounds as he expanded into the world of television with his weekly Disneyland program and the daily Mickey Mouse Club. But for the second season of that show, he and his strong right hand, producer Bill Walsh, decided to put their trust in another brand name that was universally known and respected, The Hardy Boys Mysteries, written by Franklin W. Dixon. The Hardy Boys serial came about when they were looking for a set of titles for the second year of the Mickey Mouse Club, but they wanted something with some adventure to it, some excitement, and the Hardy Boys was just what they were looking for. It had been a very, very popular series of books going on for almost 30 years. The series' popularity was tied to its main characters, Frank and Joe Hardy. Intrigued with their father's detective work, these teenage brothers set out to solve mysteries of their own, taking the reader along on their exciting adventures. There are mysteries about the series itself, however, mysteries such as just who was the author, Franklin W. Dixon. Franklin W. Dixon was just a name used on the Hardy Boys, and there was no one person who was involved in it. Uh, instead, it was a name owned by a group called the Stratomar Syndicate. The Stratomar Syndicate was founded by Edward Stratomar. They produced about 1,600 series book volumes between 1905 and 1985. Some of the popular series include the Bobsy Twins, which started in 1904. Edward Stratemeyer, who founded the syndicate, wrote that first volume. The Tom Swift series started in 1910. The Hardy Boys, of course, started in 1927. And Nancy Drew started in 1930. In the early 1900s, the writer and literary agent Edward Stratemeyer made two important decisions. In response to the increased protection for owners of written works afforded by the Copyright Act of 1909, Stratemeyer formed the Stratemeyer Syndicate to employ teams of writers to write for him under various ghost names. He also decided to focus exclusively on the juvenile market. As he told a friend in a letter from late 1900, I've made up my mind to stick to juveniles, not only under my own name, but under nom de plume, and I'm studying that market in all of its conditions. The response was encouraging. With a team of talented ghostwriters and outlined story formats, the Stratemeyer Syndicate began to provide young Americans with a string of successful books in series form, including The Hardy Boys in the 1920s. There were different ghostwriters that, that created them, you know, the Franklin W. Dixon name being just the pen name. And there's a big argument where the Leslie McFarlane ones, uh, I think, generally accepted as the better ones. He had been hired by Edward Stratemeyer in 1916. He literally answered an ad. Stratemeyer had an idea for a new hardcover series, The Hardy Boys in this case, and uh, he asked him to write those. By the 50s, those mystery books were an American institution, so it isn't surprising that Walt Disney considered adapting them for his new television series. But Walt Disney faced a daunting challenge, since the Stratemeyer syndicate was leery of Hollywood. Walt was initially going to just create their own series about detectives, and then somebody suggested for name recognition, the Hardy Boys. Unfortunately, the relationship between Hollywood and the Stratmeyer Syndicate wasn't all that pleasant. They were reluctant to deal with Hollywood until the name Disney came along. You know, Walt really had a reputation for being a straight shooter and honest. He also shared a lot in terms of his moral background and his upbringing that was common to Edward Stratmeyer, who had founded the Syndicate. Oh, no, no, lad. There's nobody dead. It's just legal words, that's all. The contract between Stratmeyer and Disney is pretty standard, but it had an interesting one in there as far as a morality clause. Very emphatic things that the boys could not do. No guns or knives if that's what you're thinking of. The two men saw the Hardy Boys series in the same way, aiming to provide young people with daring and suspenseful stories from the point of view of two teenage boys, pouring their cunning and youthful energy into solving mysteries. Once Disney gained the syndicate's trust, it then faced the hurdle of converting the books into a TV serial format. The writer, Jackson Gillis, had been given the task of converting the book. On the whole, the characters in the Disney serials were reasonably close to the books themselves. There are, of course, some differences. For example, in, in the very first book, there is no Aunt Gertrude. She comes in the books later in the series. The Hardy's mother, Laura Hardy, is not there. When I asked uh, Mr. Gillis why he did that, he said he needed to have a way that the kids could disobey an authority figure but not be their mother. So that if they were sneaking out in the middle of the night and they're told to stay home, that it was viewed very, very bad to not listen to your mother, just sort of bad not to listen to your aunt. You know, Ben, if you'd stay home once in a while, you'd realize what good boys you do have. Who are you, anyway? Perry Robinson. In the book, Perry Robinson is a friend of the Hardy Boys, and his father is accused of the crime. 
Well, in the serial, there's no father. Perry's an orphan, and now he's accused of the crime. The thought here was that kids would have a harder time identifying of a parent who's in trouble and potentially losing his job and losing his house. The sergeant's up there telling Dad about Jenkins, the guy who wrote the letter. In the book, there's one villain. He comes in very briefly, and he's never seen again. In the serial, there's two villains, and they're very, very active. The Bowles character, who is sneaking around, and he's sort of a stereotypical uh, villain with his striped shirt and his little peaked cap. But there's also somebody else, Jack Jack Lee, and you're not really sure, is he a bad guy or not? Until later in the show, it becomes true that he's a very bad guy. Well, what's this about beat up and robbed? With the writing challenge solved, the next step was finding the young actors who could bring just the right chemistry to their portrayals of Frank and Joe Hardy. We're the Hardy boys. Oh, is that so? Sons of the great private eye, huh? When they set out to cast Frank and Joe Hardy, it was very interesting. Did they go with names uh, that were people who were going to know and recognize or go with unknowns? There was a lot of consideration for using uh, David Stollery and Tim Considine, who had been so popular in the, uh, the Spin and Marty serials. And the issue there was that they were both about the same age. The actors uh, are approximately the right age, maybe just a slight bit young to the early books. And that's an unusual feature because the, when the stories were first written, the characters were 15 and 16, which is about the ages of the two actors. The stories that many people are familiar with today actually have the characters being 17 and 18. To my viewing of it, it seems like they were acting a bit younger. This is probably to meet up with the core audience for the Mickey Mouse Club. But Tim Considine was pretty much the hands-on favorite of people that had seen him. When they read the book and they read the story, he just seemed to fit the part for the uh, amount of enthusiasm that they wanted. The younger brother really gave him a lot of trouble trying to figure out. They, they went through quite a few pictures of actors. They ended up doing nine different screen tests. And they picked Tommy Kirk, uh, who had come to the studio's attention the year before. He had done a very brief piece going to the Democratic Convention as a reporter for the Mickey Mouse Club newsreel. Certainly, J the Joe character uh, is more impulsive. Uh, Frank is the, is the more stable one. But if there's going to be a, a leap of logic that uh, helps to solve a case, then you're going to normally see that from Joe. If it is something that is uh, uh, through induction, uh, then it would be something that would normally come from Frank. That's the trouble with us. A good detective would stop and figure all those things out. Joe, can I be a hardy boy too? There was a big thing going on for who was going to play the female role in the show. For a while it looked likely that they were going to just take the same success they had with Tim Considine and Annette Funicello from the Annette serial or from the Spin and Marty serial and use them in the Hardy Boys. She would have played a character that was eventually dropped from the show, which was Callie Shaw. They decided to make the character the younger one, Iola Morton, and went with a relatively unknown actress who had done a few TV shows before. Carol Ann Campbell did a few things after the Hardy Boys, but not too much. The actress just got tired of Hollywood and, and moved on. The next question, which of the more than 30 Hardy Boys stories would be the right one to dramatize? Disney's first choice was obvious. Hey, you know what? That's gold. Applegate Treasure was based on the first Hardy Boys volume, uh, The Tower Treasure, from 1927. One of the changes that uh, Jackson Gillis made to the story was, what were the boys hunting for? I mean, in the show, the whole mystery starts, and somebody's digging up something, and they find this doubloon lying there. The, the theft had occurred years ago, and people weren't even sure, was there a theft? Was Applegate crazy? Had this theft ever occurred? It was just a story he had told. So right from the beginning, to think about getting to, into the psyche of kids, when the, when the serial first opens, you see the Mickey Mouse Club logo, and the very next thing is a pirate flag. And you see buccaneers running up and down pirate ships, and swords, and, and explosions, and, and a big thing with a great song by Thurl Ravenscroft singing about gold doubloons and pieces of eight. So now the gold and pieces of eight all belong to Applegate. The chest is here, but wait. Now, where are those gold doubloons and pieces of eight, pieces of eight, pieces of eight? I'd do anything to be a detective, even arithmetic. There are boy detectives sometimes. Sure there are. In the first books, uh, the Hardys desperately want to help their father uh, solve a mystery, so that part's true. E each time you read a book, you uh, generate your own visualization and impression of, of how things should appear. And the, the, the requirements for what makes a successful book and what makes a successful film are completely different. It was eventually decided that they would focus more on the boys and therefore make it more of the Hardy Boys story with less uh, involvement or attention from the other characters. It's not so much fun being a detective after all, is it? 
The next hurdle was how to film so much nighttime footage with a couple of adolescent actors. Once again, the Disney Studios' creativity provided the solution. Party Boys was an interesting filming challenge for Disney. So much of the show had to be done at night. Uh, the boys had to be digging up the Applegate yard at night. They had to be running around the railroad yard at night. They had to be doing all sorts of things at night. And that produced all sorts of troubles and efforts for them. So Disney made the decision that they were going to film the majority of the show indoors. And uh, they, they built almost everything you see on the Hardy Boys is actually shot on Disney Stage 2 right in the middle of Burbank. They built an elaborate set, 200-something feet long, of a city street, street lights, sidewalks, so that when Iola Morton comes down the street and she gets the bag thrown over her head, she's on stage two. When the kids are out there and they're digging up Mr. Applegate's yard and the, the bushes are flying and dirt's going and everything, they're on stage two. When they're going through the railroad yard and uh, you know they're trying to find the treasure and Jack Lee's ready to push them in front of the train, all on stage two. It was very well done. They, they couldn't take a full-size train and just rip it through there. So they did it with sound effects, they did it with the flashing of lights to simulate trains and the lights of windows going by. There was a lot of danger, to the point that the very first episode seeing the introduction, uh, Tim Considine warns the viewers, hey, some of the stuff you're going to see is scary, but it, it's just a story, it's just make-believe. I mean, a mystery's a mystery, that's all. Well, they'll find out. They sure will, all right. See, see you tomorrow. tomorrow. The studio got a number of letters from people complaining that, you know, hey, this was really great, but my kid didn't like the thought that his heroes could be thrown in front of a train or that somebody could actually shoot them or do any of these bad things. So they kind of toned it down. Unfortunately, I think that kind of put an end to the Hardy Boys film project. Now, Gertrude, there wasn't any danger. Okay, boys, let's get to bed, huh? But not before the Disney licensing and merchandising team got hold of the property. Well, there was a wide range of uh, collectibles connected with the uh, Disney version of the Hardy Boys. We have a, a board game that uh, was issued by Parker Brothers that's uh, uh, perhaps not as fun to play as the Nancy Drew board game, also from Parker Brothers from the same time period, but a great uh, uh, set of graphics on that. I bet you were up there looking for a treasure the same night you hit Mr. Jackley over the head. Too many comic books. Back in the 50s, uh, Disney was one of the most prolific generators of comic books. The Hardy Boys was, certainly fell into something that Disney saw some marketing potential for. They did a total of four comic books based on the Hardy Boys. Uh, the first one was a very faithful adaptation of the TV version of the serial. Don't you understand? Now we'll have time for a mystery with us. A real mystery! Because in the days of no VCRs and everything, boy, I had to make sure I was home the next day and I had to make sure my homework was done because there was no way I was going to have my parents punishing me by saying no TV today. So no fights with the brothers and, and probably actually helped with the dishes or do anything I could to be there and watch the, the next day because if you missed a day, well, how did they get out of that? The fact that Mickey Mouse Club fans, like me, still remember the serial so clearly and so fondly after all these years, says something about just how successful it was. I think the Hardy Boys are the most wonderful detectives in the whole wide world. Yeah.